Come on, Gold Coast, baby. We're 15 minutes out of the line. Gives it off to Tommy Weaver. Weaver's been good today. Jalen DeGroote also been good. Tony Francis. Tony Francis. Tony Francis. I think he might have got this. Come on, baby. Tony Francis with a double. Tony Francis with a double, baby. Let's go. Yeah, g'day, Titans fans, and welcome back to the Gold Coast Titans Frontline Podcast, a Titans-focused podcast that covers our club and community as holistically as we possibly can. My name is Dane from Clarkie's Rugby League column, and I'm joined every week by my co-host, Blaze, from BKR Sport. And Blaze, footy is right around the corner. We've got one trial out of the way, we've got another one to come, and then it's round one, baby. It's, it's the best time of year, isn't it? Mate, this is definitely the best time of the year, that's for sure. If you guys are here on YouTube as well, obviously uh, I don't have my green screen behind me, but I do have an absolutely beautiful view of Broad Beach right now, looking over the water and stuff. So it is a really nice way to do this podcast, especially after such a promising game for the Gold Coast Titans on the weekend in our first trial with a bunch of development guys that we'll talk all about today and whatnot. But yeah, look, overall, man, it's just such a good time. Uh, you know, we've got all the preseason games last week, this week. You know, we had the Maldi versus Indigenous all -Star stars game and just all the chatter and as I say all the time as well like this is the point of the year where everyone cares about rugby league you know the first little bit this is actually kind of people don't realize this this is actually a bigger time than the grand final because everyone's teams haven't disappointed them yet no one's kind of put them out out of favor and said you know we're not gonna be good enough this year everyone feels like they've got a chance and everyone's kind of hyping up and whatnot so yeah I love this time of the year man just the, the chatter is great everyone's getting around it and uh, ready to rock and roll yeah, all the top eight teams are kind of looking and, you know, for signs that history is going to repeat itself. And then all the bottom nine teams have that hope and optimism that this year is going to be different. We've well, got a big show. I just, sorry to interrupt you, but I guess it's something like, you know, the Cowboys, you know, the other year, they came 15th and then they were the team that jumped into the top three. The Warriors, they were 15th and then they were the team that jumped into the top uh, four. So the point of the matter is, is that, you know, there is that hope from these other fans and all these uh, these teams. And we're sitting here on this podcast, you and me, thinking, well, maybe we could be that team this year and be the one to jump out of the bottom four to, into that top four, right? So it does, at this point of the year, everyone does genuinely have that kind of belief because it has been done before for the, the bottom four teams. Yeah, certainly agree. I mean, when you look back on history and there's examples of clubs where when the Cowboys finished um, and played, I think it was they finished in the top four, if not they were fifth, um, that season, I actually tipped them for the wooden spoon. Mm. So it just shows that rugby league can be so unpredictable and and that hope and optimism isn't always blind, um, and especially not in our case as Titans fans. But we do have a big show this week. We're going to go over all the Titans news. Now, it's not too much there. We're going to review our trial loss to the Dolphins, give out our three two ones, talk about how our players went in the All-Stars women's and males games. We're going to preview our trial against the Eels, give our prediction for that, and then we'll close the show. Before we get into the show, guys, if you are here on YouTube, please slap that subscribe button, drop a like. Uh, it, it just really helps the numbers grow in this community, and that is ultimately our aim, to connect as many Titans fans and give them a great show they can enjoy every single week. And the same goes if you're listening to this as a podcast. Now, Blaze, only one real bit of news to go through. Um, Jimmy Lenahan was on SEN Radio, and he pretty much confirmed Jaden Campbell and, and uh, Andrew Fafita. Wow, when did we sign him? And Dave Fafita, rather, are going to miss the early season rounds. Um, I think he said somewhere around that round three mark. Um, now, off the top of your head, I know we've got the Dragons in round one. Do you know who we have in rounds two and three off the top of your head? Yeah, so I I thought I remembered him saying the first five rounds of the season, which might be a little bit too okay. long. Uh, but with that being said, you're the news man. That's what you do. So you, mm. I trust your word over mine, to be completely honest with you. But yeah, look, obviously it's pretty disappointing. The first five rounds for us are a really nice draw. Obviously we have the... Uh, Dragons round one sea bus. We have the bye, which is beautiful for these injuries, right? Because it just means that we don't have to play a game without some of our star talent. And then in round three, we have the Bulldogs at Belmore. Round four, we have the Dolphins at home, the Kick Care. And then round five, we play the Cowboys up there in North Queensland. And I think the, the, the important thing for us right now is that those first four rounds we should be expected to win these games regardless of who we've kind of got out there in regards to Dave and JC. Like, Dave and JC are two of our best players, right? We've got some phenomenal talent there. However, the first four rounds, 
one, we're going to get three points for the buy, and the Dragons, the, the Kicker Gear, and also the uh, Bulldogs are not teams that we should really be, realistically be overall worried about if we're considering to be a really solid team this year. So the only issue comes is that if we get into round five and these guys aren't back yet, then we have a Cowboys trip to North Queensland. We have a trip to Canberra against the Raiders. Uh, we play somebody at home, I think it's Manly, and then we travel Manly, to yep. New Zealand. We play the Warriors yep. in New Zealand, I believe it is. So that is a really, really tough stretch there away from home and it's it's slightly concerning so as long as these boys can get back in time for those away games that's kind of what i'm really focused on because the first four games i'm not saying are easy wins but are definitely easier matchups than the others yeah i agree with that and it's not that i don't have faith in the depth that we've got i think kind of can going to absolutely shine in these early rounds and then i think he's got an opportunity to lock down the 14 or 15 jersey for the whole season if he plays well enough and then for back row we know we've got Arlick, we know we've got uh cleese haas bowie firma comes back this year there's so many different options there uh joe stimson another that i'm not worried at all there oh, i've kind of got that round four circled against the dolphins mm. not because i think it's an incredibly tough matchup where we need to be absolutely full strength but just because I really want to beat the Dolphins based on what happened last well, year. Absolutely, man. The Dolphins have won. And and look, I'm going to say something that has been kind of spoken about a little bit since the Dolphins game, right? So obviously, guys, I was live streaming the, the Dolphins versus Titans game on the weekend. And we'll, we'll talk more about that when it does get to that moment. But I have been hearing some pretty crazy reports that, uh, look, the Dolphins fans were treating that like they won the competition and they were quite abusive overall uh, when they won a trial match against a bunch of development players so for me it just really provides me more dislike for that club like obviously they beat us a couple times last year one controversially and one that we don't speak about it's he who shall not be named in regards to that result uh we beat them in the preseason last year but it just feels like it, it feels like they're just a real kind of annoyance when it comes to the gold coast titans so for me yeah i definitely want to beat them because you know for them to carry on and act like they've won the comp because they beat a bunch of development players when they had you know like 12 out of their starting 17 players for the season or 13 there you know it's a bit disappointing to hear so no i definitely want to beat the dolphins and i want to beat them well yeah i agree if the dolphins want to build a rivalry we're here for a rivalry we're baby. here for the rivalry and, uh, son don't you we'll, worry we'll we'll turn up we'll turn up rain hail or sunshine uh we'll be at your stadium at our stadium it doesn't matter for us uh but let's jump into that trial review then since we're there already uh we lose to the dolphins 26 to 14 and i think i speak for all titans fans when i say we can all be proud of that loss i've got here 17 uncapped titans players only six with nrl experience and a lot of those were like 10 games or under against a full-strength Dolphins side minus their All-Stars players, which you then turn around and say, well, we're missing players to the All-Stars as well. To be leading 8-4 at half time, that's massive. That is, mm. That's just huge. You know, we spoke about it here last week. We didn't want to get blown off the park early and have players' confidence shattered. Um, it was the complete opposite. The, comp the players' confidence couldn't be any higher after that. An incredible start. But my takeaway from that first 60 minutes was really our goal line defense. You know, this was a Dolphins side where it's not like they were making a ton of errors coming out of their own end and we were just able to dominate field possession. We literally had to defend our line a fair bit and I thought we did a really good job of that. So that was my key takeaway and something that really made me excited with Des Hasler here. Uh, but I'll go to you. Let's cross to you for your thoughts on the game. How did you see it and how the left stream go? Yeah, look, we won that game for me. We, we, we won that game 100%. And I feel like that's probably why the Dolphins fans were so antagonistic was because we we, we beat them, in my mind. Uh, we had, a, as you said, a full development team out there whilst the only players they were missing was Hamiso and a couple of guys in Jesse Bromwich and, and uh, Kenny Bromwich who obviously are kind of getting towards the back end of their careers anyway now. You know what I'm saying? So overall, like they had a pretty much full-strength lineup out there. I think, well, was Marshall King also out or was he playing in that game? I believe he was in, yeah. Yeah, he was in. So they've got a pretty, they pretty much played a full strength lineup, and we played, you know, a, a whole bunch of guys that are knocking on the door, but obviously aren't at that stage yet. So yeah, really, really promising signs from the team overall. And when you look at these kind of games in the preseason, you're looking at kind of how the club has changed overall from the bottom up, right? And that's what we want to see with Desi. Desi comes in and changes us from just a, we want to attack and chase us down if you can, which fun fact for you, here's an answer for you, they can, because we saw that many times, right? So it's not about chase down if you can, because they will do that, as we've seen. So it's good to see that Des has improved the defense and implemented a really solid structure 
from the ground up and it, it's just telling signs and you know if people go out and say well it's not just des it's a whole other people well great that's great because that means we have a really well functioning organization right now and it, it, it's come in time with desi coming in so look as much as we love justin you can see the difference already and we haven't even seen our starting guys out there so it's such a promising sign to know you've got guys like tony francis who scored two tries in that game three tries in the grand final of the q cup you know you've got guys like arama howe who made a whole bunch of tackles you know he really he didn't play the 13 role that we were expecting he played the back row um but also that's another thing i did predict that they were going to just shuffle all those kind of more known players in which is what desi did uh, but at the end of the day you know like we didn't we didn't go into that game. Oh, another one to mention, Tommy Weaver there, but we didn't go into that game expecting to win. We went into that game expecting to be beaten by 50. Like, that's what should have actually happened. I'll tell you guys right now, we should have been beaten by 50, but we didn't. In my mind, we won that game. We were leading 8-4 at half time. We were leading 8-4, I believe, up until like the 50th minute or so. And guess what? When we started to lose that game was actually when we started taking out guys. Right, so that wasn't even the guys that we started with. You know, you keep those guys in there, and we might actually go on to win that game because there was a lot of direction. There was great leadership from Isaac. There was great leadership from Tommy Weaver. And again, these are our depth players. So if this is what our depth players are doing, imagine what you're going to see out of our starting players. Yeah, completely agree. And I think that's that's a great point you touch on there. You know, when the Dolphins really did start to score points late, by that stage, we were we had players on that are like eligible for under 19s and 20s. They wouldn't even be the third depth option at our club in their respective positions. And that's when the Dolphins started scoring through like, you know, genuine NRL players. So there's, uh, there's absolutely no shame there. One point I really liked was uh, Herbie Farmworth. He scored on our left edge nine minutes in. And then we kicked it out on the full. So that gave them a penalty on halfway and they were straight attacking there again. They went straight back to our left edge, which I can only think, you know, they're looking back at the Titans of old thinking, yep, we've we found their weakness. We'll go over a few more times here now. And literally the very next time they tried to do that, Jermaine Asako got dragged over the sideline, who's yep. the Dalian reigning winger of the year. Got a so question I love for that. you though. Got a question for yeah. you regarding that. Did Farnworth put the ball down? Yeah, I'm going to say if the referee sent it up as no try, I'm looking for an angle that shows a conclusive evidence it was down. It's going to be no try. I think because the referee went up as a try, they couldn't 100% say it was held up. So it just had to stand. But on that specific point, I'm, I'm some t- I would honestly be enjoy the honesty if a referee just said, hey, I don't have clear visibility of the ball. Please review it and give me your thoughts. Well, as they do in other sports. It doesn't make sense because... We couldn't see. I, I don't. The referee has assumed, right? So the referee has assumed that that ball has gone down to the ground, which doesn't make sense. Like you either. I feel like that should be the advantage of the defending team. If you're going to assume something, then I would assume that the ball hasn't gone down. There's no assuming that the ball has gone down because then that's just going to be yeah, absolutely beneficial. So for me, to beneficial to the attacking team. So for me, I just feel like there was no way even close, that the referee could see that that ball went down to the ground. So why call that a try? Like, when you're Mm. looking at the camera angles, the commentary was saying the same thing. We're all saying the same thing. There's no actual evidence that that ball touches the ground. And I would actually lean with the fact that I didn't think it was a try. I did not think that it went down. So, look, it's unlucky. It's it's controversial. It's unlucky. I'd have more of a complaint if it was a regular season game. Uh, It was a preseason, so kind of it is what it is. But I I definitely have my doubts. And I think, yeah, the referee shouldn't assume uh, for the attacking team. I think some of our players' body language as well, like they didn't kind of get up and celebrate, yes, we've held him up, whereas Farnworth got up right away and was celebrating the try. So I think even the players, because there was three or four on the tackle, I think even they weren't 100% sure. And they're also young dudes, so they don't want to get up in an international space and be like, no, held up, held up. So they kind of just went with the flow there and the referee took over and and made the call there. Um, I disagree with it too, but I'm not going to complain because it is only a a preseason trial. Um, But I did really love how we dragged Asako out there when they tried to go back. Um, some other highlights for me. Feel free to jump in whenever. Tommy Weaver's kicking game, and and also in general play, but also finding touch from penalties, man. Some insane yardage. There was one where he would have been, I want to say, 10 or 15 minutes in, in uh, meters in from the sideline, rather, and he booted that like 45, 50 meters. That was absolutely unreal. Um, Jalen DeGroote's line break in the first half through the middle. I love that. It was um, very explosive by him. And it just shows, the, as you touched on with me after the game, the great production line of fullbacks we've had here on the Gold Coast. Um, I loved Oscar Bright when he came on. I thought he won us a ton of momentum through the middle, and he really ran that ball out well. Whereas Vaka Sigahale did a sick job as well. 
Um, in the same breath, you know, he was he was great in his own way where he had great service and probably a tough edge to his defense and Brian. So both had great strengths there at Hooker. I think that's a, that was a benefit to the game. Uh, like, obviously, we had, uh, you know, we, we discussed that we have this depth in the hooker department with Vaka Sakele and Oscar Bryant. And I feel like Oscar Bryant was ahead in the depth chart. But right now, I don't know who is ahead of the depth chart because I did think that Vaka had such a phenomenal game. And I thought that he really did help us out greatly uh, from the start before Oscar Bryant obviously took over later on in the game. And I thought, yeah, I thought Vaka was was really, really definitive in, in the way that he was kind of making his moves and, and running around. And, and to your point about Jalen DeGroote, as well, like Jalen DeGroote, that was a really, really great performance, and it just shows that we just know how to develop fullbacks on the Gold Coast, man. You know, to go on a point from last week, Jareen Buller came through the Gold Coast development system. You've got uh, Jerome Hughes, who, who was originally a fullback on the Gold Coast before he obviously went to the Storm and has now become a uh, halfback. You know, you've got AJ Brimson, you've got Jaden Campbell, you've got Keanu Kinney, uh, you know, and there's there's others that are kicking around as well, to uh, Tainto Alpiki from the Warriors. And then now you've got like Jalen DeGruy, and it just shows the the depth that we have is so significant because yeah he was really really solid he didn't really put too much of a foot wrong uh, as we said last week had a, quite a bit of injuries last season uh, so now it's time to, to get back into it and I thought he did definitely get back into it and he had a try assist in the game obviously had a tackle break a line break line break assist as well um, he ran for eighty nine meters uh, through eight runs so over ten meters per run there uh, and I thought yeah I thought he was really solid so you know we've got Keanu Kenny J C there but at least if you know a touch would have happen but if something bad happened to the both these guys and we were running low I know AJ more than likely would get shifted there first but it's not like we don't have a, a product there in uh, in Jalen DeGroote and he's still eligible, I believe, for Hastings Steering's Colts, or at least that's what he played last year, which is a junior division here on the Gold Coast. So super young, super great career ahead of him. Really, really nice touch there. Um, I would be absolutely remiss if I did not mention the performance of Isaac for us. Oh, he's unbelievable. That was the best game I've ever seen him play in the NRL or Queensland Cup. 100%. And, you know, just because his brother come of age at such a young age in the middle there, a lot of props don't hit their physical prime until... 25 26 27 so i really hope that's the makings of isaac taking that next step in his career and really developing into his frame and you know getting that grunt about him that was awesome um josiah pahulu he had some powerful carries man had some great leg drive i, I love that every time he got the first contact he continued that leg drive and when he knew the momentum was done in the tackle he'd get down on his uh front so he wasn't getting rolled to his back and producing a slow mm -hmm. play of the ball He's super young. I think he's still a teenager. So to have that IQ announce about him, it was cool to see as well. Oh, those two front rowers there, man, or those two forwards were just unbelievable. Like, Josiah Pahulu, I feel like it was definitely his... It was definitely his first game in the in the big leagues. You know, you could definitely tell that he was fresh. But with that being said, like, it was good to see that he had that quality, even though it was fresh. And I'm really excited. I, I always say how excited I am for Josiah Pahulu. He's the next big thing, man. And, you know, he is a, a real talent. So, yeah, look, I think that uh, had a good game. And I think it's, it's going to get even better from here because that was his real fresh kind of debut where you don't really know what to expect from a rookie in those games. They can really make it or break it in those. And yeah, I think that he's absolutely got a big future ahead of him. But yeah, I'm really impressed with Isaac. I think Isaac for me was a, a very really dominant leader in that game. And that's what I really like about it because he's so young. And, you know, there was no real leadership for me in that team like going into the game, you know, like I know we had Simo and whatnot who has played some, rugby, uh, some uh, games before. I know we have Shoopy and whatnot, but overall, there was no like dominant leader that I found across the, the 13 that we were starting out with. And I feel like Isaac Fasul Malawi actually started that out and showed that he was the leader of this team and, and just ran amok and, and showed that he, it, looks, it looked like he had a bucket load of experience. It looked like it. And, you know, I, I don't think that he's had the greatest of time throughout his, like, you know, getting into the, the NRL and whatnot. But I feel like this could be a real change of direction to really show that he is, you know, just as good as his brother. Maybe even better if it one day if he keeps on going down this path. Because, again, that was just such a good leadership quality game from him at such a young age. Yeah, he's got me super excited to watch him this year. And you're right, the, the pack leader seem to be missing with so many young guns on our side. And you only had to look across the fence of the Dolphins and see Origin reps in Tom Gilbert and Tom Flegler to know that they had their pack leaders. Um, whereas you're right, Isaac and Josiah, particularly Isaac, I will say, stepped up and filled that role, which was wonderful to see. Um, of course, we've got to mention Tony Francis. That is five tries in his last two games, one being a grand final. Um, but I love that both his tries were different circumstances, right? This wasn't a guy that got the ball and fell over the line. One was a great corner finish, 
And the other, he had to beat his defender one-on-one with muscle and get that ball down. So I love that from Tony. I w- just want to say here as well, I want to quickly go and have a look here in regards to get to Tony Francis because, you know, just to... to actually, no, you know what? I will actually go on with Ken Mamalo while I go and have a look for something. The only reason is because they're both wingers, obviously. So I guess I, we can, I can respond to them uh, together. Yeah, perfect. Well, Kenny Mamalo was someone I didn't expect to be giving a shout-out to here, but that was the first time he's actually ever worn a Titans jersey because he did join us last year midway through the season. And he had some really strong carries, man, particularly off our goal line. Like, he was the guy putting his hand up for the first hit up and saying, yeah, I'll take that tough carry. He had some great late footwork at the line, which allowed us to get a quick play of the ball. And although he wasn't his best defensively, I just think if he wasn't generating that momentum to start some of our sets, we really would have got bogged down in our own end. So you've got to give big credit to Kenny Mamalo there. Uh, But what did you make of our wingers' performances? Yeah, look, I think that uh, Kemma Marlow was... I think he was definitely fine. I do think that it's very difficult to get to get above Tony Francis right now with the form that he is in. Like, Tony Francis, for me, I think, you know, pretty much guarantees that he, uh, he is that guy, like that next steps guy uh, behind... You know, is he trying to get up above Jojo for feeder? Is he above Jojo yet? I'm not too sure. But with that being said, his form, his form technically is better than Jojo's right now, even though Jojo just played in the Indigenous All-Stars game uh, for the, the Māori team. And yeah, look, I, I'm just really impressed with our depth in the wing because again, Kemba Mala did his job. So I'm I'm fine kind of if he was to come in as well. I do think his best years are obviously beyond him. That's for sure. But with that being said, I'm not upset if uh, I'm not upset if he's, if he's playing in a game for us and just back on Tony Francis I am going through games at the Bears the last time that he didn't score was in mm. round 21 for the Bears and that was against the the Mackay Cutters besides that scored a try in round 22 uh, scored a try in finals week one and then scored another try in the Bears Seagulls game week three and then in the grand final scored the hat trick and then scored another two tries in this game here today, uh, this weekend so Tony Francis is running an absolute muck right now and it's really hard you know when people are commenting saying oh where's Tony he should be playing it's like well, we've got a lot of camp prayer and Phil Sammy like uh, that's the, this is why it's so good because we've got this guy who is absolutely bursting but we can't fit him in it's not possible mm, he's one of those players where like I can see him getting selected for Tonga or Lebanon if they have internationals this year, potentially before he plays NRL, because he has so much talent. And a side like Lebanon, you know, with Josh Mansell now retired, doesn't have the most amount of outside backs available to them. Tony can, of course, play centre as well. So honestly, he could be one of those those weird cases where he plays internationally before he plays NRL, um, just because as you touch on, he really has to wait for an injury because we have such established wingers there now. Uh, but he's in brilliant form. I only got two negatives coming from this game, and they are very minor negatives. Um, one was the Cleese Huss hair pull. He accepted a $1,000 fine, which I just think is stupid. <laughs> Why is he paying $1,000 for accidentally grabbing someone's hair? No. I, just, I just think that's so stupid. My favourite part about that is I saw comments on Instagram that were saying that Cleese and the Zion Ma'u'u uh, one was both head contact, so Cleese should have been sent as well. And I messaged Cleese about this, and I said, mate, you should have been sent off. Um, and we just had a good laugh about it. But like, to, for people to compare, like, have you seen that Zion Ma'u'u hit for the uh, the yeah. Warriors on the weekend? He, like... <laughs> he, he's going to challenge it, and he's going to get five weeks. Is he challenging there is no it? Compa- he is challenging it, and he's going to get suspended <laughs> five weeks. So he knocked him out cold. Did his he shoulder knocked... went directly into his nose. Like... <laughs> if I was the NRL, I'd give him six weeks and say, you've absolutely wasted our time. This is the worst challenge ever. That's outrageous, bro. Like, how do you challenge that? But, like, to, for anyone who doesn't know what happened, Zion Ma'u'u for the Warriors in the 20th minute of the game, his shoulder, like, directly, with power, went directly into the nose of a Tigers player, completely knocking him out cold, and it was actually really, really scary, and he got sent off of that, and there was someone on Instagram, a couple of people on Instagram, that were comparing that head high contact to Khalees, when he was clearly grabbing at the collar. Like, he's obviously clearly trying to grab the collar, and and you've got uh, Jerome uh, who has long hair and his hair goes beyond the collar so as he's grabbing at it he's obviously grabbed the hair and it is what it is right so you know it's it's silly and like obviously we don't want to see it but in that sense like it's just so funny to see people comparing the two I just can't believe he's been fined a thousand dollars for that how does the NRL, <laughs> NRL genuinely justify that like it's a trial game where he accidentally grabs someone's hair along with the collar like yeah, he gets yeah, both and then he realizes I just think that's crazy. So it's a slight negative. 
but it's it's more of a what the hell is going on here. Um, and of course, the other negative is now we cannot win the preseason challenge, but I think all Titans fans knew we've got bigger fish to fry. And, you know, Manly won it last year um, and did nothing in the regular season. So it, it doesn't really matter. They've won the last two, that. haven't they? I don't think they just won this one. I think they won the last two, Manly. Well, it only became the preseason challenge officially last year, but they probably would have won the trials um, oh, yeah. ladder the, the year before. Um, so they missed out on a hundred grand. Ooh, <laughs> and I'm, I'm sure they're <laughs> devastated. Uh, let's jump into our trial three, two, one. So I'll kick us off because I think everyone knows who I'm going to pick. I've got Isaac Fa'asua Malawi, who had 11 hit ups, 100 meters, 19 tackles, two tackle breaks, and two offloads. And of course, he was off the field for 15 minutes, getting a head injury assessment. So an incredible stint by Isaac. Uh, do you mirror me with three points? And I'll also get your two. Yeah, I definitely am going to mirror you with the three points. Again, just so impressed by his leadership ability. Just so impressed with the leaps and bounds. And I feel like he really kind of put himself on a on an opportunity with Desi Hasler to say, hey, listen, I want a spot on that bench. Because obviously he's not going to be able to get into that starting lineup right now with the, the crazy talent we have, unless you saw Tino go to the 13, which, funnily enough, is actually what Tino's doing this weekend. Yeah. But I doubt it for the regular season. Uh, but yeah, look, Isaac, he's putting his name up for a spot on that bench. And I absolutely love it every Every single part of that game, he was just showing such real grit, determination, and leadership ability, which is what we love to see. Uh, number two here, I am going to go with Tommy Weaver. I'm going to go Tommy Weaver nice. here. Like I, I know there is a couple of players here that, like for example, that you'll probably get into in a second, but I just think that Tommy Weaver showed that he really is knocking on Tanner's door and he's really knocking on the potential 5-8 spot if Kieran Foran obviously decides to retire at the end of this year uh, or, or we don't really know what Foz is doing, right? So, you know, I think that that really gave people a lot of hope and promise that we do have an answer if we do have one of those injuries in the halves. I am intrigued to see if Tommy can play a 6 role though. Like, obviously... I think he can, but with that being said, I do think that him and Tanner might clash a little bit with their play styles. I would love to to be proven otherwise, but with that being said, like we do still have someone there that can come in and implement a role if Foran is down injured uh, or Tanner's down injured, and uh, we all know how much of a workhorse he is as a player as well, uh, because we saw in that Bulldogs game last year when he came on, he had a broken eye socket, like his whole eye yeah. was gone. I think, as we're filming this today, by the way, I think it's his birthday, uh, but so happy birthday, Tommy Weaver, uh, for yesterday or the day of uh, but yeah, look, I, I'm really impressed by what he showed in that game. No, nah, great pick there with the birthday boy. Tommy Weaver is definitely putting his head up. He's in the same position as my number two, Tony Francis, where they're good enough to play NRL, but they're just stuck behind some quality options there. So my two points goes to Tony Francis. He scored a double, broke six tackles and ran for 99 metres. Um, I just, uh, just to reiterate, I love that both of his tries were earned. One was a brilliant corner finish. One was muscling the defender off and putting it down. They weren't to just, you know, fall over the line tries um, like an Alex Johnston sometimes, for example. They're not to be, not to say anything bad about Alex Johnston, great try scorer, but everyone knows what I'm saying. Sometimes he just has to catch the ball and put it down. Tony had to earn those tries and they were awesome. Um, who are you going to go for one point? My one point will have to go to Tony Francis. I think you knew that was coming. That's why you didn't give your one because you knew that I was having having to go with Tony Francis there because two tries, you can't say no to that. And with just the unbelievable talent that he is, yeah, no, that is really good. But uh, I, I know, actually, no, you go with your one. I want to give a couple of honorable mentions though. Okay, well, my one point went to Josiah Pahulu. Look, he's a very inexperienced middle. His opposite number was Thomas Flegler. Um, as we touched on there, Pack had some serious experience. Felice Carfusu in his own probably has more NRL games than all of our NRL players did. So he this was really one of Josiah's first tastes at first grade level against a tough full strength squad. He took seven hit ups for 79 meters, but more than half of those meters were post contact, uh, which goes back to what I was saying with his leg drive. I thought that was impressive there. He also had a tackle break and offload and 29 tackles. So really good signs there from Josiah. He gets my one point. Who are you going to shout out with some honourable mentions? Yeah, look, I think that an honourable mention goes here to Rama Howe as well. Obviously, coming back over from the uh, Super League, well, from the championship over there. But I do think that he did a pretty good job there in the back row. I've got his stats up over here. So he actually, like in regards to fantasy, everybody, he actually uh, got well, second behind Tony Francis. Now, Rama Howe in that game had seven runs for 55 metres, uh, but... 
he made 25 tackles, which is, where is it? 25 tackles made, which was the most out of the entire... No, sorry, Josiah Pahulu actually did get 29, and Oscar Bryant 27, but he was in the top three for tackles there. So I do think that Arama Howe does deserve a mention. I will also say, Harley Smith-Shields, he looked solid, man. Like, he looked really, really solid. Again, how do you fit him into this team? But have a look at this. He had 10 runs for 111 metres. Like, he was a machine in this game. And I don't think that many people thought that he was going to get a crack for this team because of our depth. But, you know, our centers, look, we've got Brian Kelly, we've got AJ Brimson, and we're waiting to see what they can be like together. But our centers have been a problem for a couple of years now. So, you know, if Harley Smith Shields can keep doing stuff like that, like, that was a really impressive performance by him. Uh, also had three tackle breaks on that as well. So, uh, yeah, that was quite impressive. I did see Shuppy really giving it a solid old crack there. Uh, Kyle Foxwell deserves a bit of a shout here in that number. Number seven as well. I thought that try set up for him uh, kicking it across to Tommy Stedman uh, was fantastic. And no one really, you know, with all due respect, not really knew who Kyle Foxwell was before this game. But you know, he he did put his hand up and say, "Hey, listen, well, you know, I can uh, I can direct play around." And another one here is Luke Burton. Luke Burton in that front row, eleven runs for ninety five meters. Uh, he had, let's go here too. He had a tackle break. Uh, had plenty of hit-ups there, um, and he also made 22 tackles, right? So he was well effective in this game. And again, another block, he made a couple of errors here and there, but overall, you know, he really put his whole body into it. So yeah, very impressive with the, uh, with the team overall. And look, on the podcast, we do try to remain positive 99% of the time. Occasionally, there are times we need to be critical. I don't think this is a game where we can really be critical of everyone. I'm super proud of everyone's efforts and really, really proud of that. Um, but yeah, happy to leave that in the past now. That trial's done and dusted. Um, and we've got a big, big season ahead of us, which we will Actually, get to. you know what? I want to say here just very quickly before we move on. We thought Joey Werner wasn't at the club anymore. He played in the game. Like Joey Werner's yes. still, still cracking on. So he's with Tweed, which made him eligible to step up. And he replaced uh, someone on short notice, uh, uh, Seth Nicotimo. Yeah, that's right. Seth yeah. was withdrawn. I'm not sure why. I'm not, I'm not sure if it was an injury or just rested but yes we probably should have mentioned that Seth was withdrawn pre-game and Joe Vuna had another opportunity in a Titans jersey let's go NRL All-Stars let's go through and preview uh, sorry review how our players went in that one so in the women's All-Stars we had Jamie Chapman Talia Flumayano and Shaylee Bent representing us all for the Indigenous All-Stars now Jamie Chapman another person with five tries in their last two games uh, she had two tries 214 meters more than double every single one of her other teammates bar one she had seven tackle breaks and two line breaks, the most of anyone on her team. And I just think when you talk about this double in a big game and her three tries in the grand final, the fact she's still 21, I'm going to make a bold call here and say she is the best center in the women's game. And I know you've got your your Jessica Sergis's and I know you've got your Isabel Kelly's. Um, I know you've got your, uh, what's her name from the Broncos, Tufanga. You've got so many quality centers in the women's game. But Chapman is a complete product and she's only 21 which is insane to me. Um, would you agree? You, you think she's the best center in the women's game at the moment? I think 100%. I think she's on the you know the form of Tony Francis right now with the, the amount of tries she's yeah. scoring. Like, let's, let's have a look at it for a second. Two tries in this game. She scored three tries in the grand final. And I, I, she scored, I think, maybe one try against the Raiders, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, not against the Roosters. But also, she scored that hat trick against the Parramatta Eels as well, late on in the season as well. So, she is just in an absolute try-scoring frenzy right now. Uh, you know, obviously playing for New South Wales, playing for the Indigenous team, and, and playing for our Titans girls. She is just absolutely phenomenal, man. And it was really impressive. And, and the good thing, I guess, with this game as well, is that it, the game started off with two Gold Coast Titans girls actually scoring the first two tries. Yeah. Well, I, I think for like Jamie Chapman too, if she wasn't versatile enough to play wing, I think she's at the stage of her career where she would play centers for the Australian Kangaroos. But I think it's kind of like, hmm, I'm trying to think of examples in the past. Maybe we're like Ali Brigginshaw played lock when, when everyone knew she was the best halfback option, but she's just filling that because she can play that versatile role for the Maroons. That's probably the female example I'd give for that. Uh, Talia Fumayano, she only played half the game here. Um, this was her first game back from her injury, of course. Didn't impact the game too much. Not too much to review there. Um, and Shaylee Bent, she scored a try, broke two tackles, and made 24 with zero missed. Um, so, yeah, really a, a really great effort from all of our girls there, in particular Chapman and Shaylee Bent, you'd have to say. 
You'd also kind of have to point out as well, though, that like the game was over pretty quickly. You could tell that the game was you know done and dusted, and you can also tell that the the quality did start to. And this is in the men's game as well. That both games were pretty much blowouts early doors. So you did see a lot of the like they're not going to completely clock off as teams, right? But you did see that they didn't want to embarrass the other team. Like it's a it's a cultural round. It's a it's a respectful game overall. It's competitive, but it's also respectful. So you're not going to see the indigenous girls want to just go and whoop the, the Māori team by 50 points, right? Because that would just be a bit silly to the concept. And I did feel like that was kind of the way. So, you know, for the opening start, you saw Chapo score a couple of tries very early. You saw Shaley Ben score a try early. And then you did see the Indigenous team really kind of take a little bit of a step back there just so that it wasn't a complete and utter blowout. And we did see a lot of errors from both men's and women's. I guess like we always thought later on in that game, because again, effectively, it is still pre-season trial, right? Like, it's not, sorry, not trial, but it's pre-season. So this was the first hit out for all of these players as well. So uh, I thought it was a good product, uh, but with that being said, I do think that, I think Chapo would have got a third if they were going fall out for the, the entirety of the game. Yeah, I agree with that. And I'm just realizing while I'm speaking here, I have forgot Shannon Marto. So I'm actually very lucky that I remembered that then. Of I course, did. she did represent the Māori All-Stars. She had 12 hit-ups, um, so that's the most of anyone on her team. She had 119 metres, by far the most of anyone on her team. Mm. 57 of those post-contact, also the most of anyone on her team. And she also had 17 tackles, which is in the top five for her team. And we love Shannon here on the podcast. Well, we, well, I, I thought when I was streaming the game, I said, I think she's the best player in this game right now for the, the Māori All-Stars. I think she was yeah. the best performer. I, I can't think of who else would really take it over, to be completely honest with you, because it just seemed like every time the Māori All-Stars were trying to make a move, it was through Shannon Mato making a big-time run. So, yeah, I thought she was phenomenal. And I know when we talk best in their position in the women's game i think shannon's probably in the same i think so but i think it's the same as chapman where people from other clubs would argue their players and there are arguments most people would say millie boyle i assume but i'd comfortably i'd feel very comfortable nominating both chapman and shannon marto as best in their positions with that being said though do you think that's because we don't have a loud fan base because you know, you find that in regards to everybody, the Roosters have a loud fan base. Well, a loud-ish fan base. Actually, you know what? I wouldn't even say it's still with the fan base with the Roosters because they're not a loud fan base. But I would say that they're obviously more respected and renowned for having those quality players. So people talk more about them rather than the Gold Coast Titans. And we don't have enough of a, 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 a resounding voice as a, as a fan base to really go against that overall besides people like myself, people like you, you know, and the select few that do really put themselves out there to you know protect the name of the club overall there's not enough of us that really kind of shove down the throat that this player is the best which is what Shannon Marto is like you look statistically she probably was the best front row she won you know Dalian for front row last year uh you know she is above Millie Boyle right this very second that doesn't mean that overall career wise she's better than Millie Boyle but right this very second Shannon Marto is the the best front row in the game and I, I think it'd be very hard to argue against Jamie Chapman too but I'd probably listen more to I actually probably listen more to people saying that Boyle over Marto than I would uh, players over Chapo. I think Chapo is pretty clearly, definitively, right this very second, the best center in the game. But Shannon Marto, uh, I, I think she's the best problem in the game, and I think statistically will probably prove that as well. No, you're bang on. Statistics absolutely back our girls there as the best in the game. Um, when we were making our predictions for the women's Daly M team and where we might feature in that, um, statistically, we were a big chance in a lot of different areas there and unlucky to miss out on some. Uh, On to the men's all-star game. We had Alofiana Khan, Pereira, and Brian Kelly. Jojo Fafida and Keenan Palacio represent us in this game. I thought Jojo probably struggled to get involved in this game. He did only play 33 minutes with three runs, uh, but then he was taken from the field with a cork. So I'm guessing he picked that up really early. Keenan Palacio only got 32 minutes from the bench. In that time, he had six hit-ups for 42 metres and made eight tackles. I probably expected a little bit more from Keenan, but I thought he would get more minutes as well when I made my prediction. He'd be second best to Joseph Tarpany. Lafiana Camprera, you guys already know, he scored a try. Of course he did and ran for 80 metres. And Brian Kelly came from the bench. He played 29 minutes and he took four runs for 88 metres. So overall, a great weekend and um, great work by our boys. They all represented us very, very well. Super, super proud. 
Yeah, that's impressive from Kelly, you know. Uh, four runs for 88 metres. That's uh, 22, mm. 22 metres per run uh, on average. So, like, obviously that's not how it worked out. There would have been a line break or whatnot. But at the end of the day, like, 22 runs for uh, over 88 metres. Uh, sorry, 22 metres over the four runs uh, is just really impressive there. Uh, I do think in regards to JoJo as well, the game didn't suit him in the sense that, you know, I, he may have got taken out with the core, but I do think that Jesse Arthur was was performing pretty poorly as that yeah. fullback, and they did shift the fullback to uh, who they put back. I think it was Cody Nicarima, who they might no, put Nicarima, back. Nicarima, yeah. Yeah, Cody Nicarima to the fullback, which then put Jesse Arthur to the wing. Because for me, uh, Jesse Arthur isn't a fullback. He didn't perform great at that position at all. So that's what I thought originally. So I didn't even know about this cork uh, in regards to JoJo. Uh, but with that being said, you know. I, I, I don't really kind of... I don't really, honestly... Like, I would have loved to have seen the battle between Jojo and Lafayette Camp Prairie there. But with that being said, they were also on separate sides of the field. And, you know, they, this game was... It's a bit of fun, in my personal opinion. It's a cultural representation. It's a bit of fun. So, look, it, it's kind of disappointing that he didn't get to play a full game there. But with that being said, yeah, really impressed there with, with Lafayette when he got the ball. But we almost knew that was going to happen. Uh, and Palacy, yeah, didn't get a great deal of minutes overall. But... I don't think anybody was going to beat the performance from Joseph Tarpany in that, that forwards uh, for the Maldi team, to be honest. No, and we both touched on that on the podcast in our, in our mini previews we did. We said we want Keenan to be man in the match, but we acknowledge that it's highly unlikely with someone like Joey Tarpany there. Mm. Let's look forward to next week. We've got a trial this week against the Eels up there in Ipswich, the home of our new feeder club, the Ipswich Jets. The Eels are coming off a 16-38 to 38 loss to the Raiders. They were missing a lot of their big stars in that game. I did pick out six or seven players that will probably be in their 17 this year. Uh, but this week, they have named a literal full-strength side. So thank Eels, full-strength as if it was a regular season game, which we have as well, minus our injuries, of course, Dave Fafita and Jaden Campbell. Let's go through the team list now and uh, have a look at who we've got. So our fullback is Keanu Kinney. On the wings, we've named Khan Pereira and Philip Sami. Our centres are Brian Kelly and AJ Brimson. Halves, Foran and Tanner Boyd. Front row is Fotuaka and Keenan Palacia. Sam Barrels is our hooker. Jacob Arlick and Bo Firma make up our back row with Tino at lock. Our interchange is Chris Randall, Big Jamin Jolliffe, Aaron Clark and Cleese Haas. And of course, we can access our reserves because it is a trial. And they are Joe Stimson, Harley Smith-Shields, Joe Joe Fafita, Tommy Weaver, Jalen DeGroote, who gets another opportunity. Love that. Josiah Pahulu and Isaac Fa'asumala Awi. So... Without further ado, what do you make of this lineup? Any surprises for you? What are your key takeaways? Not really any surprises for me, I would say. I do think that it's really good to see. I haven't really had a great look at the, the lineup until we've jumped on this podcast here. And I think that it's really impressive to see Jalen DeGroote there added into the reserves because it does say that Desi was impressed by that performance and it does. And rewarded of- it. Yeah, rewarded it. Exactly right. And and that's really, really positive there. People will look at the team list who don't really look as in-depth as we do and just think, oh, yeah, he's just adding another guy just for the sake of it. But for me, I think he's absolutely rewarded, as you said, a great performance there by an absolute youngster. And it's not like we... we you know, it's not like we needed to play him. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's not we've got a full strength team here effectively, and it's not like we needed to play him, but he has been put here. So that is really positive science there for him. Uh, I think that obviously, the back row. I don't know if it's going to be Jacob or Khalees Haas as we start the season. I actually, like, I saw. I, 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 I can't. I'm not going to talk about training, right? Because I don't want. I don't want Desi to think like I'm saying things from training. So I'm not going to speak about something. But I'm. I'm really not. Sure, who our back row? Well, I'm not really. Yeah, I can't really go too in depth into kind of the back row department. Obviously, Dave is our starting back row, right? Uh, but it's going to be super interesting to see uh, if it's Jacob, if it's Cleese, or if it's potentially somebody else. There is a lot of options that we do have on offer there. Uh, so yeah, that's that's a big one to watch. And Jacob Alec, obviously a Papua New Guinea international, uh, was actually meant to play in the Indigenous game, but got injured. So. I'll be interested to see if he does actually play in the back row here and you don't see Khalees go in or anybody else going in there. Uh, Really good to see what Aaron does off the bench as well because 
you know, I think the one thing that we've got to really refocus everybody on here is that this is not necessarily what Desi feels like is our starting lineup. I think that one through seven is absolutely the starting lineup. I don't think there's a debate, debate there. Obviously, Jaden Campbell comes back from injury. He'd go back to the fullback and Keanu Kinney, uh, whether he's on the bench or he goes back to Tweed, we don't know. But overall, that's the only difference in that one through seven. But that forward pack, I don't believe that Tino plays the 13 this year. I believe that Tino is the front row, but I do think they want to test out to see if Keenan Palacia does come in, absolutely smashes it in that front row, and then you do move Tino there, because the question mark about our team is around our 13. The question mark is around our lock. So um, I'm a big believer in Tino 10 uh, rather than 13, but I do like the the addition there of Palacia, just to see if, you know what, maybe maybe that could be a play, and Palacia can do what he did for the Titans like he did for the Broncos in the finals. My first question I've, I suppose I've got over this team list is Aaron Shop excluded. Um, I, I'm not sure if he got That's injured last week. If he did, I didn't, I didn't see it. Um, we have named all 24 of our reserves, but I would have thought Des would have put someone like Shop in instead of Jalen DeGroote, even though DeGroote is a fullback. That's a good point. Yeah, so I'm not sure if if he's fallen out of favour there, if he's seen enough and he's happy with what he's seen. I'd be speculating if I had to guess why he's not there. But yeah, Shoppy is missing from our lineup this week. I um, would as is- speculate in regards to that and say that there probably would be some form of a niggle or an injury because I don't feel like... you've obvi- You can obviously see here with this team that the best guys on offer that we in our general opinion the best guys on offer are selected here so i would not and with all due respect to Jalen de Groot, Shup is obviously ahead of him in regards to experience and the likes so you know if Jalen has got this spot over Shuppy and Shuppy isn't injured that is significantly interesting because it means that Desi ranks him really highly it does show that he he ranks him really highly or he doesn't rank Keanu Kinney as an 80-minute fullback, um, which I don't think it would be that. I'm just throwing out some possibilities there. Um, the other person that's not there, of course, is Isaac Liu. I can only guess that's based on his experience and the miles on his body. Coming into the final year of his contract with us in his 30s, what are you really going to see out of Isaac that you don't already know? He's a premiership winner, international. Um, so that moves Tino to 13. I don't think that will be our lineup during the season, as you said. I just think they want to give Palacio a starting opportunity and see how he looks there. Uh, but yes, during the season, I certainly do expect Tina to go back to prop. I like that Jacob Barley has got Fafita's vacant back row position. I'm super excited to see more minutes out of him. That's something we spoke about a lot last year on the podcast. We wanted to see more minutes from Arlick. Mm. Um, and I also love that Bo Firm is there as his back row partner. I'm so keen to see Bo back. He's worked so diligently and hard um, in his ACL rehab. And all Titans fans are so excited to have him back. Very keen to see Sammy Verrills with an uninterrupted and full healthy preseason. And when I go to preview this game, I actually think Sam Verrills would be really important to us winning because the Eels do have a forward, a really powerful forward pack. And we know Sam Verrills can really get out of dummy half, play that crafty role, engage that A defender and markers and get those forwards on the advantage line to generate momentum. That is going to be really key uh, because the Eels do that so well themselves. You know, they've got... Paulo, uh, Campbell Gillard, Hopgood. They've got some big boys in the middle there. So really excited for this game. I expect it'll be a great clash in the middle um, for the reasons I said there. And then really their halves, I think, are going to look to attack wide and early and, and isolate and test some of our defenders. And I think that's a great thing. The way that Mitchell Moses and Dylan Brown play both sides of the field and you know really get that ball early and get it to the wider men, is awesome for us because I don't think their centers are so potent that we're going to be in huge trouble. Like they're not passing it early to a Joey Manu or a Stephen Crichton, but they are still quality enough that it's going to be a great test to see how our goal line defense and how our defense as a whole has evolved. So I don't want to go too deep into my analysis here as it is at the end of the day, a glorified trial game. I know it's called the preseason challenge, but it is a trial. But I actually think that if we lose this game, there's merits that will come to next week hungrier to work on what we didn't. And I think if we win, then we can just take confidence and go, hey, we're pretty much full strength. Everything Des has shown us this in the offseason worked. So I think there's merits whether we win or lose in this one. Uh, but that's how I break it down. How do you break this one down? 
Yeah, look, I think that this is going to be an interesting game because without going into a preview in regards to the Parramatta Eels, you guys can go to the channel for my take on that or Clarky's Instagram and whatnot, Facebook, to hear our takes on that. But without going too deep on it, the Parramatta 1 through 7 is very hot and cold. They're very 50-50, especially their halves. Uh, but their they're 2 through 5 in Mike Acevo, Will Penasini, Bailey Simonson and Sean Russell does not light the world on fire. If you're talking to me in 2019, Mike Acevo lights the world on fire. But this is five years down the track and he just isn't the same player that he once was. And I will remind everybody that when we took on the Parramatta Eels last year, we didn't lose either of those games. And I'll say that right now because I was at Combank and we all watched Combank and we all know we won that game because Tanner Boyd should have gotten two penalties to kick it and the NRL admitted fault. So we've beaten this team twice. And I think that we are a much better team now under Desi's direction than we were then. And I could see us really doing nicely here. Obviously, again, it's a preseason game, as Clarkie has said here. I do think that you know we have to look at this game and recognize that if, if we do lose whatever, you know, we just want to see how this team goes. Because at the end of the day, you'll only see most of these guys for the first half. In the second half, you'll probably see Kieran Foran come out. And guests will come in. Tommy Weaver there. You probably will see Tanner play for the majority, I would say. I will more, more than likely say Tanner plays the majority alongside uh, Tommy in the second half. So that we can see that future combination. Because outside of that... There's no one else out there that can go into those halves there. So only one of those halves, unless you put AJ in the 5-8, which would be absolutely pointless, considering he has been moved from the fullback to centre, so that would just mess with his like thought process. That would be stupid. So you're more than likely going to see at some point Kieran Foran come out 30, 40 minutes in, maybe 50 minutes in, and then guess what? Probably at half time. And Tommy Weaver will either go into the 6 or the 7, and Tanner will go to the 6 or the 7. More than likely, Tanner stays 7, Tommy Weaver 6, so that we can see that future. So that's something that I could be um, quite excited about, because I want to see how those two guys work together. Uh, again, those the, the forwards battle is insane. Like It's not like the, the Eels, their, their bread and butter is their forwards. Because they've got Reed Campbell Gillard, Junior Bolo, Sean Lane. Uh, we've got our ex player in Bryce Cartwright there, who uh, is happy to play good elsewhere, just not with us. And then Jermaine Hopgood. Uh, so they've got a, a really solid team. And Campbell Tualangi is a guy who will come on in that back row, and he dominated in that game, even though it was against a, a Raiders team that was, you know, development. And yet the Raiders absolutely put a, a score past them as well, mind you. So there are a lot of exciting things about this game. Uh, I think that it, 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 it could. Absolutely, be actually a 13 plus as well. I, I think that this could be a big win. But with that being said, this is the preseason, so it's more than likely going to be a close game. But if I was to lean with anyone getting a 13 plus, I would absolutely say it was us. Nice. And I don't want to go too far down of a sidetrack here, so I will just quickly note for our listeners the NRL has now adjusted the field goal uh, rules and adjudication following what happened to us last year. So the bunker will now review every single field goal next season per report. Oh, that was because of us. Well, they didn't outright say it was because of us, but we were the only team that was really stuffed by it. No other team really got <laughs> stuffed by it. So I'm, I'm assuming they've looked back and gone, yeah, we need to, we need the bunker to be able to review it because we can't call it on the Titans one week and not call it the next two weeks. <laughs> like so, it's outrageous, man. I still can't get over that. How do, how do we get dudded by being the team in the offside position controversially against the Dolphins? And then the week after, we get dudded with the other team being the one in the offside position. So for the, yep. we, we lost off both sides for the opposite reasons. <laughs> yep. The other one that comes to my mind is the 2021 finals game against the Roosters. Maria oh, Hargraves, yeah. all their forwards were blocking, standing in the front there. That was cheating. I said um, this on the stream, actually. I said, this was yeah. before the, the knowledge about this field goal stuff came out, but I said this, like, you know, in regards to, uh, we were talking about something, and... I said, like, if, if it might not have been the Titans, it might have been another game, but I said, you know, if, if things are, you know, in regards to, like, penalties from field goals and whatnot, we're the ones who have been probably done at the most part, and we referred to that, that Roosters game there, because, yeah, look, absolutely, it should have been a penalty to us rather than a field goal to the Roosters. Yeah, and I didn't want to go down too much of a rabbit hole there. Sorry to our listeners, but I'm sure everyone's really glad to hear that we're not going to be dudded by that in the future in the NRL. Oh, <laughs> that. So oh whoa, awesome. whoa. Sorry to be the antagonist to the situation, but I would still not trust the bunker. The bunker yeah. also called the David Fafita try and no try. So I mm. don't necessarily believe and, and 100% back in that we will not be dudded in the future. I will just throw it out there that, uh, yeah, look, um, let's, just, let's just hope for the 
the best. Clarky, let's just hope for the best. Let's touch wood. I'm touching wood right next to me right now. I'm not sure if, you, if you're on the podcast, you, you don't know, but if you can see on YouTube, there you go. I'll do it loud enough so you can hear it on the podcast. We're touching wood. Okay, we're slamming wood. <laughs> All righty. Yeah. Uh, prediction for the Eels game. So you're going to go 13 plus or you just think it's going to go that way? Potentially? No, I'll, I'll, go, I'll go 1 or 12 because it's a preseason game. If it was a regular season game, I genuinely believe we have a much more balanced and quality and dominant team than the Eels do, despite the fact that on, on paper they've got a quality team. I think they're a bit of a shambles, but I am a little bit higher than other people are this year on them. They are a competitive team overall, but I do think that our back line is way faster than their back line. Sivo's not fast. Penasini's not fast. Bailey Simonson's not fast, and Sean Russell actually is pretty decently fast because he caught Xavier Savage on the weekend. So I would say that even though I think Xavier Savage has lost speed, I don't think Sean Russell is actually that fast. I just think that Xavier Savage has lost speed. So for me, you got Loffy and Sammy, two guys. Well, Sammy caught Josh had a car once, and also Loffy is possibly the fastest player in the game. And BK and AJ Brimson, both mainly Brimo, both have speed about them. So. I think that our speed battle... And look at Gutho versus Keanu Kinney. I'm telling you right now, our 1 through 5 blitzes their 1 through 5 in regards to speed. And I think that the uh, the, the positions that they win in is only the 6 and the 7 in Dylan Brown and Mitchell Moses. And again, that's 50-50 because they are so hot and cold. Yeah, I think that the, the, their halves are where they have an edge on us. So I would agree with that. I do expect the Eels to have a strong season, but I don't think it starts here. I'm going to tip this one to 12. I see this one being a low scoring affair, probably something like 22 to 16 to us. I just think it will be a low scoring affair because the Eels last year were not that good defensively. And no doubt that's been Brad Arthur's focus as defense mainly as every team's focus. And we know that our focus this preseason has indeed been defense as well with Des. So I can see a great defensive effort from both sides, a low scoring contest. I think most of our tries are going to come through Loffy and Sammy when we catch them short on an edge. But I do have a bit of a bold prediction that I think Bo Firma will score. Uh, because oh, we know that... I was about great. to say the exact same thing, bro. Like when you were talking about the wings there, I was like, I feel like Bowie could score here. I was thinking yeah. that in my head. It's great you said that. Well, I think because Kieran has built such a great connection with Dave on that left side now and Bo was playing left side, I think he would have spent a lot of time this preseason with Tanner on the right side. And he's going to want to prove a point in his first game back. He's going to have so much energy. We know as the fittest of the club per reports um, that they gave to the newspapers. So I think that he'll be up around the ball. He'll be there for a short grubber. He'll be there for an offload. I just see Bowie being like a little bit of a pit bull, just around everything and ready to go, ready to pounce and score. Dude, he so, would be chirping right now, man. Like, again, yeah. shout out to Bowie, man. Like, he has gone through a couple of big-time injuries now, and he just keeps on coming back. He yeah. is a... Dog, D-A-W-G. Like, this guy knows how to get his body right, and I'm telling you, like, he would be chomping at the bit to run it straight down the guts, on the edge, but also just run, you know, on the edge and then just cut right back in at Junior Bolo. Like, this guy wants to... Mm -hmm. He wants blood, man. And Bowie Furman wants blood, and he knows that this is a game to really, you know, set that foundation for the 2024 season. So, man, I, I cannot wait for Bowie. Yeah, I just can't wait to be back here watching Bo uh, back on our screens or, or if you are going there to Ipswich Live back in front of you because we all love Bo Firma and we're all really proud and excited to have him back. Uh, but yeah, that will be our prediction for the game. We're both going 1-12. to We both think Bo will score and we both seem to think it'll be a bit of a low-scoring affair. Um, so with that, that is our show for today, guys. We want to say thank you very much for being here with us. Of course, we'll be back next week to break down the trial game we just previewed against the Eels. We'll also break down our game against the Dragons round one at home. That will both be out in the front line. So hopefully we can see some of you there. Um, I reckon let's also hand out some NRL predictions next week. Let's go who's going to be our best player, best back, uh, best forward, etc. So we'll come up with something creative for you and guys And who's there as going well. to score the game-winning try in the grand final for the Titans. That's another one. And how many kicks is Zach Lomax going to miss in round one? <laughs> let's add that one in. <laughs> I jest, I jest. Thank you very much, guys. We bloody love yous, and we can't wait to see you next week. Cheers. <laughs> uh, the answer to that question is all of them. Uh, but yeah, appreciate you guys. Thumbs up, subscribe, and uh, get on Spotify, Apple. We appreciate you guys. You've been absolutely killing it on Spotify and, uh, and Apple recently and smash it on YouTube as well. So we do really appreciate you. Let's get a good win here against the Bermuda the Squeals this weekend. Absolutely slap them down. And let's show the NRL what we're damn well made of. This is what we're talking about. Great team lineup, and it is time to absolutely smash it. So we'll see you guys next week, baby. Get around it.